tell you a little bit about our guest speaker today here, Tim Bishop. He's the owner and director of Perform Fit Sports Performance and Wellness. He runs a great, great operation. You have a chance, you should check it out. I mean, it's top shelf. He oversees personally himself all corporate wellness programs. So if you're interested in starting a wellness program for your corporation or a group of people, he can help you with that too. The most important thing we talked about, I think, anyhow, he's a former strength, strength and conditioning coach for the Baltimore Orioles, and he held that position for over 14 years. He'd probably still be there today if Amy didn't put her foot down and said, you got to stay home here a little bit. You got it. <laughs> a lot of travel, a lot of travel when you're a professional, work with a professional team. He has a BS bachelor's degree in exercise physiology, has a master's in exercise science. He's a certified strength and conditioning specialist. He's also registered as a strength and conditioning coach, both through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. How many people knew about that association? <laughs> there you go. I knew there had to be somebody One. here. He's official. Uh, he's also a published author. He's written on uh, fitness topics for men's health, Maximum Fitness, Men's Fitness Magazine, and has also appeared in USA Today. And he's actually published a DVD entitled Power for Sports, as well as a book, Stronger Legs and Lower Body. Jack, you got to read that book, Stronger Legs and Lower Body. He used to, bench, he used to squat over 500 pounds. <laughs> Middle body is a whole different story. You got to listen up. <laughs> You're on that special seafood diet, don't forget. Mm. Seafood, you eat it. Anyhow, uh, he's a former member of the Maryland Fitness C Council and a consultant to several area companies. Some current and former corporate wellness clients include Fundamental Administrative Services, Maddie and Mules Physical Therapy, Maryland Transportation Authority Police Department, the entire police department, as well as hundreds and hundreds of individuals. Also, I gotta point out, he's a very, very good golfer. Don't mm. bet him on the golf course. <laughs> Hits the ball over 300 yards, and I'm, he knows where it's going, too. Uh, thank you. A lot of guys don't, <laughs> as we know. <laughs> yeah, we, a lot of your balls are still there, too, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. Tim, we, we talk about fitness, you know, and obviously you work with professional athletes and many, many professional athletes, and they have rigorous, rigorous programs that they go through to really maximize their physical conditioning as well as their performance on the field. What can the average business executive or the average person do? What can they take away from that to really help themselves, people like Jack, to really stay in shape and get in shape and, and uh, grab it by the horn? Well, I think... Uh all of you people are in this room because you have something in common, and that is you're driven, uh, you're organized, you're probably even a little bit anal, I would say. And I think that you've got to approach your wellness, your fitness, your nutrition with that same regard in that I've done this my whole life, and so it's, it's a habit. It's something I need to do, I must do, I want to do. When I wake up in the morning, I've got my little post-it notes on my bureau next to me. And what if I have a thought in the middle of the night, I'll jot it down. You know, I'm still old school that way. I don't keep my notes in my phone just yet. I'm working on it. Um, <coughs> but I also think of what am I doing today for my body? What, what's my workout today? That's one of my first thoughts in the morning. And then I plan for it. Today, I don't put one of these on very often, maybe a couple times a year. Um, but today, when I got up and put this stuff together, or the night before, because I wanted to watch the World Series, I also thought about how am I squeezing my workout in today, because now my routine's off. And so I packed my sneakers, I packed my protein bar, and I had to make adjustments. So for me, a pro athlete is doing that all the time. If you watched any of the World Series, you saw a guy two nights ago, Game six ended. He knew he was pitching game seven. He was out in the field at one o'clock in the morning playing catch because he knew he was pitching the next day. And that was his routine. And he didn't get to it because of the travel and so forth. So I think what you can take away from what professional athletes do for their fitness, for their wellness, is have a plan. And it's got to become part of what you do. And you've got to be ingrained and become a habit. You know, you guys do your quarterly taxes, you do all this stuff by habit, you have it on a calendar, this should be on your calendar every day, or just about every day. And once you get to that spot, then it will become easy, routine. The hard part is breaking through that. That's really hard. <laughs> I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, 
So if you're not there, if you're there, terrific, nice going. If you're not, <coughs> find a support system, find somebody that can help you stay accountable to get to that point. Once you break through, you'll get it. But the hard part's getting to that point. Great point, uh, Tim, and you talk about routine. I mean, we hear, talk to a lot of people and they say, I like to work out in the morning because that's the only time I can control. You know, you, people say that, well, I work out after dinner. Of course, after dinner, you have a glass of yeah. wine, you have a beer, you're talking to the wife or the, or the husband. Yeah. You know, is that, are you finding that people controlling their time more of a routine, do it in the morning? No, I think that's a great point. Uh, a lot of the adults that we train are early morning people for that very reason. I, I want to check this off the list. The best way to do it is in the morning, then I don't get a conference call, it doesn't pop up, or you know, if I do it at lunch, you know, somebody's grabbing me or something ran over or something came up. If you can get it done in the morning, then you check that box and, and you're good to go. It's not easy, you gotta set that alarm, get your butt out of bed. But I think that's where a workout partner can help you stay accountable, or a trainer, or just some scheduled appointment. You're more likely to make it if you have some kind of support system, you'll be more likely to make that morning appointment. But I'd love the morning for that very reason. Again, it's commitment. We talked before, or I talked before a little bit about Cal Ripken. And of course, everybody in this room reveres Cal, I guess, in terms of what he was able to accomplish. I mean, but you know, avoided injury, maintained his fitness, 21-61 straight games is about almost 14 years. I think he won 25-63 was the magic number, which is almost 16 years of not missing a game. A lot of people don't know he played every inning, probably for about seven, eight years too, until his father, when his father was the manager, he pulled him back because they thought he was doing too much. And you hear the old axiom, if you ever make it to the major leagues, these guys don't want to come out of a game because they're afraid the next guy is going to take their job. It's one of the things. How was Cal able to do it? What did you do in, to help him on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that was going to happen? Well, I would like to think I helped him a tiny little bit, but he was a, is a un unique, remarkable person. Um, a genetic freak in my <laughs> mind. Um, think about your own lives. In the last 16 years, how many times have you had the flu, food poisoning, stomach whatever, that you just, you know what, you might get into the office, but you're just doing some paperwork and you're out, or maybe you miss a day. 16 years. This guy, that's the stuff that I, it's more remarkable to me. Not that, oh, I'm tired, I can't do it, but he played shortstop, which is right in the middle of the field, where people are sliding into you all the time. You're virtually in every play. Um, so the injury thing is, is very unique, but the off-field illness, sickness, that kind of stuff is just crazy. So of course he got sick, but he played. So he had this too. He was very strong mentally, very strong in here. I think he was taught a lot of that by his father. I heard many stories about his father. Uh, Cal would tell me stories about his father working on the cars back when people worked on cars. And he'd have a wrench and be cranking on a bolt and the thing would slip off and after a couple F-bombs, the thing would <laughs> cut his head open, he'd be bleeding down his nose, and he'd take the oily rag and just hold it there and finish the job, you know, and, um, you know, Cal and Billy learned that, I think, toughness uh, through, his, through their father. Uh, the other trait he has, he's, he's just very, very stubborn, and I would have no problem saying that in front of him, and I know Rob probably knows that a little bit, too, but I mean it in a good way. Um, if, if you said, you know, you do 100 sprints, he'd say, well, why, first of all, he'd ask, why 100? Why not 99 or 101? And, you know, what's the reasoning behind that? And two is, um, you, I, you tell me I can't do 100? I'll show you I'll do 100. Um, so, you know, I think when you put all that together, um, being very driven, being very anal, uh, being stubborn a little bit, um, I think that's all that added up is what got him to where he is today. And plus, we, I remember reading that some of it was a little bit of luck. I mean, he, he would jam his ankle or something like that, and then there'd be an off day the next day. It was fortuitous when he did almost get hurt and then the chance to come Yeah, out. I mean, I think that happened from time to time, but, um, you know, behind the scenes stuff, you know, a lot of people in the clubhouse knew when he got nicked, you know, or had something going on. It didn't always make the media. Um, I had him on a treadmill one time. There's a treadmill brand called Woodway. It's a high-end treadmill 
brand that has individual slats on it. Okay, it's, it's based off of an old uh, tank track. If you can envision a, a tank <coughs> track. It goes like this with, with individual metal slats but has rubber on the top. Well, we had one of those going and he was doing interval sprints where he would straddle the treadmill and then step on and run and straddle off. Well, the th one night the, the treadmill was running and he was on it and it started making a very strange noise. I'm like, I never heard that before. And before I could even get to the treadmill, the, one of the slats pulled up and shot off and hit him right in the shin. Oh, and I'm like, oh my God, I just, my career is over. <laughs> the, this was in the middle of his streak. And, um, you know, he <laughs> brushed it off. We turned the treadmill off and went on the next one. Um, but so things happened uh, behind the scenes along the way. There was times where the athletic training staff and the Physicians weren't sure if he was gone the next day, but the son of a gun healed overnight many times, too, so. You say he's a genetic freak, and I know you meant that in a positive way. His son is obviously trying to play Major League Baseball, too, and it's hard when you have, I remember Mickey Mantle Jr. tried to make it into pros and never made it. You have the last name Ripken, has got to be kind of tough. Does Ryan have a shot? Uh, I hope he does. I, I've seen him the last few winters. He comes into my place to work out and to, and to hit, and I root for that young man. He's, he's got, having that name on your back uh, playing baseball is tough, and um, he's a big, strong, talented kid. I think he does have a chance, uh, but a lot of things have to fall in place for him. Uh, it won't be handed to him, but he'll, he'll get every opportunity to do it. Uh, I'm rooting for him, for sure. We talked a little bit before about working out and whether it's in the morning or whatever time you can control. What's your best advice? You talk about having a buddy or something for a workout or the training or the methodology to be successful over a long period of time. People can start diets over a short period of time. They can be successful. They fall off the wagon, you know, and sometimes they gain all the weight back. Same thing with working out. You know, you start a program, something comes up, you go on a trip, and you're back in your old routine. What's the secret for success over a long period of time? Yeah, I, you know, I think having, uh, having goals are important, uh, whether it's just to lose a pound or two, whether it's to get, you know, I see a lot of people, there's nobody in their 40s here, but I see a lot of 40-somethings, 50-somethings. Wait a minute, there's uh, Wanda, Wanda. I was teasing. <laughs> uh, but but I, I see, I get a lot of, uh, my adult clients are sent to me by by docs that are, you know, you guys are got your heads down to the grindstone for the last 20 years. You climb the corporate ladder, and you know you're moving up. Hopefully, you're making some money, and then you go for your blood work, and the doctor says, "Hey, dude, uh, <laughs> we got to do something about this." You know, and usually it doesn't happen until your late 30s, or mid 40s or so, when you finally start to look up and take a breath, and. Um, and a lot of the people get a little bit scared. My cholesterol's through the roof, my triglycerides are through the roof, my blood pressure's high, I better do something. And I got, you know, kids at home and a wife, or a, I got a husband at home and kids. And a lot of times, uh, for me, that's a good motivating factor, is I want to be here for my kids. I want to see it as long as I possibly can. Um, so I think as we get older, hopefully our goals shift a little bit from climbing up and making and achieving and and collecting and to maybe more of, hey, let's, what can I give back to organizations, to my family, to my kids, that kind of stuff. And I think uh, to, to, for the long haul, I think you got to look at, you know, the second half too. And um, for me, that's a motivation, my family and my, my kids. What's the old saying you, uh, in your youth? Uh, you give up your health to gain wealth. Yeah. And then the older years, you give you give up your wealth to regain your health. <laughs> so yeah, it's a similar exactly, thing yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, you and again, I guess the whole that. concept is moderate. Socrates talked about it 2,000 years ago, moderation in all things. And probably that's really the yeah. secret. You know, we talked a little bit about Cal and maybe some of the stories uh, there with his, his physical fitness. I've played a little golf with B.J. Serhoff, and I've heard some of the, the stories of, in the locker room. Anything, Thing that you can tell in a public arena in terms of some interesting <laughs> stories about the boys? Have you turned that off? Yes, but no. Uh, <laughs> that stays on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I mean, there's, you know, being in a, in a, prof in a professional clubhouse is, is really special. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to be around in uh, 1996 when the Orioles uh, eked into the wild card playoffs for the first time in a long time. 
1997 when they went wire to wire and got into the playoffs. I was around for Eddie Murray's 500th home run when he came back to the Orioles. I saw Cal Ripken's 21-31, 21-30, his final game. I saw his 3,000 hit. I saw Rafael Palmeiras' 3,000 hit. Um, I saw the steroid era, unfortunately. Uh, I was deposed by the Mitchell Committee. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen a lot over the years. Um, but there's something about being in a group, uh, all striving toward the same thing, and I think you probably get that feeling in business as well. But there's, there's nothing like, uh, especially when you can succeed and, and, succeed and celebrate, uh, there's nothing like a celebration in a Major League Clubhouse. What you see on TV is just the start of it. Um, but you know, some of those opportunities were really fun. Um, and um, you know, any specific stories, I'll just I'll leave them general. That there's <laughs> a lot of fun to be had. Well, you, you make a great point. You, camaraderie you're talking about, especially when you win. They talk all the time about chemistry. Right. You know, what, what does a manager do to, to create that chemistry in the, in the in the clubhouse? Same thing in business. What do the business owners do to create that chemistry for a winning team from a business perspective? You know, you talk about 96, 97, Davey Johnson was manager of the year, and then he had that run in with Peter Angelos, right. and, and he resigned. I mean, did that have a deleterious effect on the organization at all? Was, you know, you saw Davey up front and personal. Well, I think you can go back and look at the records after that, after, for the next so many years after that, and I think it clearly had an effect. Um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I think but, it did. But the point is so well taken. You know, let's fast forward to today, you know, with, with Buck Showalter. You know, we had him speak here about four or five years ago, and just, he just seems to be an amazing motivator, just like, you know, again, he, and he correlated the things that he does in the locker room to what successful business people do in their organizations. I mean, do you see the well, same thing? Well, I was fortunate enough, too, to play for Buck Showalter in the Meyer Leagues, and that was before he was Buck Showalter managing the Baltimore Orioles, and he probably was in his... 30s, I'm sure he was in his early 30s, when I played for him, and at that time, he was managing an A-ball team, this is the lowest ranks of, of baseball that you can manage, and I'm like, this guy's pretty good, he's pretty special, because I had other managers before in college and other minor league managers, and you could see it right away, so he was a leader that was able to build a culture, whether it was A-ball or the major leagues, and it was, it's a great uh, experience for me to have seen and been through and then to see him where he is and doing the same thing at the major league level. Uh, chemistry, culture, whatever you want to call it. Uh, he was first one there, last one to leave. I'll give you a quick story. I was playing in uh, Sarasota, Florida. He was managing in Fort Lauderdale. I was a college, I was signed by the Yankees um, and this was the Yankees organization obviously. Um, he. Uh, was managing the A-ball team. We had an off day. They had an off day in Fort Lauderdale. We were in Sarasota. He took his off day as a 30-something year old guy in Fort Lauderdale. He drove across the state to watch us play uh, with another A-ball team and <coughs> drove back. So it's a two and a half, three hour drive across Alligator Alley. Any of you are familiar with that? He stayed there for three or four hours and then drove back. That was his day off. And th at 30 years old, you hear him doing that stuff now, you know, and it's true, it's real. He, he, that's what he, that's how what he learned. So he picked me out of there, um, and then I went and played for his team on A-ball. I got hurt, my career ended, flash fo uh, forward 20-some years. I'm now the strength coach for the Orioles. He's managing the Yankees, and we're at Yankee Stadium. I don't even know how I got on this topic, sorry. <laughs> it sounds good, but, though. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm stretching the team at Yankee Stadium before batting practice. He's managing the Orioles, and I've got, I'm in the middle. I've got Cal Ripken, Rafael Palmeiro, Roberto Alomar, Brady Anderson. I've got all these guys around me. I'm in the middle, and I'm telling them what to do. He comes walking out of the Yankees' dugout and comes walking across, steps over Cal Ripken, and says, <laughs> Hey, Bish, how's it going? Good to see you. And he steps back, walks over, and the guys are like, What about us? What are we, chopped liver? <laughs> And he turns around and he goes, uh, you never busted your ass for me. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. So he remembered 20 years earlier that I played hard for him, and he recognized that, you know, in front of all these other guys, which I, I thought was just a very cool thing that he did for me. But it just tells you the culture that he tries to build is 
play, be accountable, play hard, work hard, and we're good. So I think you can create that in you know, any business, any fitness, wellness plan is you know, you, you got to be driven, you got to work hard, you got to stay with it. And that's the bottom line. You hit it right there. Nose to the grindstone, yep. <laughs> work hard, yep. and don't give up. You know, he, he did a great job. For any of you guys who didn't, weren't here when, uh, when um, Buck was here, Buck Showalter, a couple years ago, it's on, it's on the CO Club website. He brought the house down. We had the, uh, we had the whole ballroom and we had a full house. He outdrew the governor that year. So, I mean, just a great, great story. Talk a little bit about, you know, again, back to the health and fitness. It's so important you run an organization. You gotta, just like Buck there, you gotta model the way for the organization. What about all the stuff we see about vitamins and health drinks and you know energy drinks and all that? What, 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 what kind of recommendation can you give? Yeah, I, I've got a, a very unique uh, outlook of the supplement uh, industry. And another quick story and another experience. When you get old, you have a lot of experiences. Uh, I was spring training one year. Um, beautiful sunny day in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, about 10 o'clock in the morning. Got the pitchers on the back field uh, to run some sprints. Uh, one of our pitchers is running in a group right toward me. And I said to one of our trainers, I'm like, Steve looks a little pale. You know, he's not looking too good. He's starting to lag behind. Went, Steve, come over here. Have a seat. You all right? And he's kind of out of it a little bit. And he's pale. I mean, I've never seen a human body look like this. It was white. It was not pale. So they take him in on the golf cart. The trainers take him and they lay him down. And he started to overheat and they kind of packed him with ice and they actually ended up calling the EMTs for this guy. Um, they take him to the local hospital and he isn't doing very well as the day goes on. And we're, our workout ends and the coach and staff goes down and checks on him and um, into the late afternoon, early evening, the, guy, the player dies. Oh, jeez. Steve Beckler. And there was a big investigation on the incident and so forth and it came back that he had ephedra in his system. And it was an over-the-counter supplement that sold every day at GNC or so. It's since been banned because of that incident. And so when it comes to supplements, again, I, I'm a little skewed on it. Uh, if you're deficient, if your physician tells you you're physician, uh, um, deficient. deficient in vitamin D or C or B, terrific. I think there's places for, for those. To take stuff just to take stuff I don't think makes sense. I think you can reach most of your nutritional goals through normal everyday food. Uh, as I get older, I've had a doctor tell me, hey, you might consider taking B something. I, I forget what it is. But I, I, and I start taking a supplemental vitamin, and that's fine. But when it comes to the energy drinks, I hate, I absolutely hate the energy drinks. Can't stand them. Um, you know, the shot things, the, all the, I mean, and it's a big, big industry right now. And I try to steer, especially if you have kids, I would steer them away from it. You guys are adults, you drink tea or coffee or caffeine, whatever. You guys can experiment with that stuff. I, but my kids, no way, no way. And, be, and for every one of the times, just a little industry in thing, insight, when you hear, and you don't hear as much anymore, when you hear a player that was sidelined by dehydration or it's probably from that stuff. They took too much or they were dehydrated because they were out the night before and they took one of those to get gone and their heart's going 100 miles an hour and they take them out. They don't say, well, he took a supplement, dehydration. And he probably was. But when you hear that, it's usually associated with something like that. Uh, fad diets and that's, you know, we get, that's a whole other talk. Um, you know, again, you just got to eat healthy. For me, the, the low fat, lower calorie, lower sugar, and don't, don't say I didn't say no sugar or, or no, you know, and moderation. Spread your meals out if possible. Be active. And that's 90% of the battle. You can nitpick the other 10%. You know, should it be this, high this, high that? You know, we have enough other things to look at and to worry about. I don't think you have to be perfect with it. You just got to be pretty good. That's all. And a piece of cake and a little pudding is not bad. <laughs> I would have probably taken one or the other, but. <laughs> got to be sociable here. <laughs> Tim, you, we talked a little bit about lunch. You know, we talked about professional athletes. You know, we hear about and read about, especially with the World Series, all the guys that are in the major leagues. But what people don't see is all the people that didn't, haven't made it to the major leagues and the trials and tribulations they go through. 
you know, you were a professional athlete playing baseball too with the Yankees. So there had to be a transition when you finally realized this is it and I had to transition into another field. What guided you into, you know, you're now one of the top coaches here in the, in the area, in the region. What guided you to make the transition and how were you able to accomplish that? Yeah, I, and I think uh, just training to get to where I got to is what got me started on it. I, I liked training and trying to get better. Uh, when the sports leave, I, hear, I see this a lot with former, former athletes. Um, a lot of people say, well, I had to train to be an athlete. Now I'm not. I'm done. You know, it was too hard or whatever. I looked at it the other way. I, I, I don't want to slip back. I want to keep going. I want to keep training. And um, I think that's what got me personally interested was my training for sports. But then I just uh, enjoyed the way it made me feel. Now, as I get older, I just had a conversation with one of my 78-year-old clients uh, yesterday. He's like, do you do that every day? I said, well, I do something just about every day. He goes, you know, it won't make you live longer. I'm like, yeah, I, I know, but I, but I feel better. And I said, I asked him, I said, well, how do you feel when you get out of bed in the morning? He's like, well, I, I start like this. And then the first thing I do is take me about three or four minutes and I stand up straight. I'm like, good, that makes me feel better. It's not just me. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the older I get, I use now exercise for different reasons. I don't need to run a sub 10, 100 meter sprint now. I don't need to run a marathon. I don't need to do all that stuff. I still like to push myself. I still like to set goals and maybe compete with, you know, colleagues or whatever. But now I, I like, it makes me feel better for crying out loud. Um, I had another client this morning came in, just got back from London uh, last night. And he said, my back's killing me because I couldn't do anything. I was sitting in a plane overnight and his back's killing him. So I think as we age too, or we sit at a desk a long time, just the movement itself is very healthy and it's productive you know, for your focus, your concentration and that kind of stuff. So I think it can shift you know, from you know, younger, maybe trying to impress a woman or a man uh, to you know, just you know, trying to stay alive to feeling better as you age. I think there's multiple steps in this and multiple reasons to do it. Uh, so I've, you know, I'm shifted to that back end where I, I want to do it because it makes me feel better. Great point. <laughs> you don't want to age, you want to age gracefully, <laughs> obviously. Talk about if, if people want to engage you in a corporate wellness program for their company or they want to engage you individually. Can you tell everybody what's involved with that and how would, they, how would the process start? And sure, yeah, if anyone's interested at all, personally or for your company, just email me call me. I'd love to come meet with you personally. Um, I'm very not a salesperson at all. And I will, I will tell you like I think it is. And if I can help you, I would love to help you. I would love to help your employees. Um, and, you know, we, we, have a, we have a great group um, that comes to us. We've sent some people out to companies too. But, and the one thing I see, you know, You'll hear a lot about the investment in wellness and how that helps your employees and, and keeps down you know, costs, and that's very, very true. But one thing I see with this group that we have in now that comes in, it's a great team building experience. Uh, these people uh, come in, they work out together, they bust each other a little bit because it's an appropriate place to do it. And then they go back and they, they you know, come at lunch. We have some that come in the morning, some that come at lunch, some that come in the evening. Uh, but it, it's, it's a good, healthy team building thing for your employees, too, that I, I see, uh, obviously, that, you know, keeping the uh, sick days down and, and, the, and the insurance costs and so forth. These, this company happens to be self-insured, so everything they save is a, a savings for the company, so they're very into it. Um, but, yeah, if, if anyone's interested in themselves, their kids, we do sports performance training for the kids, too. Uh, we wear multiple hats. Uh, just <laughs> my cards are out at the desk there. Feel free to grab one and just shoot me an email, and I'd work with you personally. Fantastic. Anybody have questions in the audience for Tim? Yes, sir. Dan, so I coach you starting the diet again, or is that what it is? <laughs> <laughs> I coach a fifth grade elite lacrosse program club, right? but they're still fifth grade boys, okay? So what's the um, balance there? But, I mean, we make it fun, we make it exciting, we don't want to burn them out, but it is high level. Yeah, well, that's Can a- Can you repeat the question for the camera? Yeah, the, you know, the question's about uh, the fifth grade elite level sports in general, I'm sure, it covers all of them. So I'm also in a unique 
situation. I have a junior in high school, a freshman in high school, and I train kids that are eight through 20 something. So I, I can see all the slices of where, and I have friends that have had kids through college, and I talk to them all the time. So I can kind of see all the, the phases of it. Take your time is my biggest advice. Please, please, please take your time. It is not as urgent as you think as a parent. I got an email today on my way over, and I was at a red light. <laughs> my, my, my son's nine, do, and I also run a baseball organization called the Redbirds, and he was asking me, can my nine-year-old try out for one of your teams, was the question mark, and the next was, do your teams get scouted for scholarships? And I'm like, okay, first of all, our teams start at 12, we don't have a 9U team, and second of all, <laughs> well, we get that one too, but my goodness, and we were talking uh, here with a group of us about you know, the, the pressure of, of athletics now and, and for kids to commit and so forth. It's nuts. Thank goodness some of, them are, some of the organ like uh, we were talking over here about lacrosse was getting kids in eighth grade, and I think they started to slow that down a little bit. Baseball's probably 10th or 11th, and what happens is they, the kids go onto Instagram and they see they follow these programs and they see XYZ committed and the, they tell their parents and the parents see it or the parents see it on Facebook. And then it's, it's this urgency of, oh my goodness, my kid didn't get any invites yet or any offers yet. What's wrong with them? Because what you'll start to see is then the jumping. All right, well, your club's not good enough because my kid didn't get an offer by sixth grade. I'm going to the next one. And there'll be coaches telling them that, hey, come here, we'll get you in front of these people. My advice is to take it slow. There is plenty of time. Keep it fun is right. But you do have to appease the parents. I'm in it I'm with my baseball organization. I'm in that balance of I want you to stay here, but it's all about education. I'll bring people in. I'll bring educators in. I'll bring people in that uh, deal with placing kids in colleges and get the real answer. So in a year or two, you might want to try to find somebody that can talk intelligently about the placement process. So it's not you, it's not another dad or a parent, it's not Instagram or Facebook. It's someone that's doing it every day. What's the reality? The reality is most kids don't commit or go until they're seniors, not eighth grade. You're gonna hear the outliers because they'll make social media. But the everyday people are committing at juniors and seniors and there's all levels of commitment. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, the, the training piece I think uh, at that age, you still need to play multiple sports. Don't go crazy on one sport in fifth grade. I think a lot of kids will get burned out on that. In fact, Buck Showalter said the exact same thing. He, he said, don't have the kid that only play in one sport. Have them play in multiple sports. It's so important. Especially at the younger ages, no, no doubt. Keith. I was saying the same thing as uh, you were talking about also young, young kids throwing the curveball and how that really messes them up as they get older. What's your take on that and really, again, like you said, you see it's just a, such a push for this competitiveness of one sport, be the best, and so that way you can get the scholarship. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's hard. There's a lot of pressure on the kids and the parents to um, specialize early. Uh, the curveball thing specifically, um, that's more of an overuse thing. What's happening in youth baseball, because it, they're being asked to specialize early, it's more volume. It's all year round. Now your arm's not getting to rest while you still have growth plates forming. Um, it happens in lacrosse too. We see kids all the time that we, we have uh, Towson Sports Medicine works out of our facility as well. So we work with the physical therapists and then we, we have a program getting kids back from physical therapy back onto the field. We see kids 9, 10, 11 years old with overuse injuries all the time, all the time in their heels, their feet, their knees, shoulders, and so forth. Um, they're just not strong and mature enough to take on the number of tournaments and games. We played a tournament this year at 14 where we played uh, four baseball games in one day. Jeez. Four baseball games. It's, it's ludicrous. But we, I have to go because my parents want to go to these tournaments. And so it's a, it's a balance. So be careful. Other questions? Wanda. Um, I'm a senior citizen. No, come on. <laughs> At 70, I mean, I'm very healthy, but I have noticed I'm losing my balance. Um, did away with stilettos, 
and when I'm on the floor, I need exercise. I need something. Huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do you say? It's the alcohol, I think. <laughs> and, and you need to get up. What would you suggest? I, I can't do high impact or anything. Right. I, and I never exercise. Right. I'm just always running to go here and there. Not running, per se. Yeah. Well, again, some of my older clients uh, do very well under good, appropriate, proper supervision with weight training. Absolutely. And you probably should be doing that if you're not. Now, let me, let me change that phrase. Let me say resistance training. Weight training sometimes is a, a, a negative. You know, I lift weights. Well, resistance training. You need to have resistance against your bones, your joints, your muscles, and so forth. And you can use that, your body weight. There's, there's tubing, there's straps to use uh, that, that can really help you, and that will help with your balance. When you have stronger uh, balance, when you have a stronger base underneath you, your balance will get better. Um, I had an older gentleman that his goal, he was so bound up from sitting behind a desk his whole career, his goal to me, and I never had anybody ask me this before, when I get down on the ground with my grandkids, I can't get up. My goal, without crawling to the sofa and pushing myself up, I want to get off the floor. That was his goal. I'm like, that's awesome. We can do this. And we worked on it. We got him stronger. We got him more flexible. And the day he, on the middle of the floor, got his feet under and popped himself up, he had the biggest smile on his face. It was one of the best things I've ever done for somebody. So. It doesn't matter your age, you can get better, you can get more fit, you can get the benefits of, of exercise. I would encourage you to start, it's never too late. Well, there was an article I remember reading not too long ago in one of the magazines, they were talking about physical fitness and weight resistance for people in nursing homes and that right. kind of stuff. I mean, it's, a, it's almost like a movement. Yeah, if you stop using it, you're gonna lose it real quick. If you've ever broken an, a limb and had a cast on it, they don't do it as much anymore, you see how quickly that limb goes small. It goes fast. Um, so, as we age, you know, you, you don't have the, the hormones as much, you don't have the growth stuff, and so you've got you've to have resistance. And women especially will have issues with uh, bone strength and, and that. Eric and Steve. If you have a half an hour, what's the best? Do you have a shower? Do you need to shower? So, for me, because um, I have clients all the time that, you know, will only have a half hour and and it's putting this right back on you know it depends what for me and I'm a realist I, I get it it depends you know are you is it at your workplace do you have to drive somewhere if you have to drive 10 minutes and drive 10 minutes back well guess what that doesn't work so for me cardiovascular exercise if you only have a half hour is should be number one without your heart the other stuff doesn't really matter okay <laughs> so if I have a choice of one or the other for me, it starts with that. Uh, could you do a little circuit and get a little bit of both? Yes, you could do kind of a circuit, meaning you could do some resistance training exercises without any rest. You'll get your heart rate up and get some res resistance training. Depends if it's a half hour every day, if it's a half hour once or twice a week. That's my specialty. It's designing unique stuff around time constraints, equipment constraints. I've been doing it my whole life. Um, and so to answer your question, 30 minutes, if, if you work down here and you're in a high rise or whatever, and you can put on your running shoes or walking shoes, that's what I would do. Um, there's steps around here, Roush Field, there's steps. I used to do that back in the day when I lived in Federal Hill. There's a Federal Hill, it's a pretty big hill. You can create a workout. If you have a corporate gym, awesome. Um, and if it's every day, then you mix in the resistance training within that every day. You can do it. I mean, it's not easy. But that morning thing might be the way to go, too. And then you. Set your alarm 15 minutes early, now you got 45 minutes. Well, that's what I figured. <laughs> <laughs> Steve. Yeah, following up on Wanda, so do you have individual programs for seniors? We do small group training. We just found that it's, it's more efficient for the client. It's cheaper. Um, and it's, for me, it's better for people to be working around each other. We'll customize a program just for that person while they're working with other people or around other people. I just like that atmosphere. Again, my background's that team approach. I don't like people being by themselves in a room one-on-one. -on -one. I just don't like it, never did. 
With that said, we do some personal training where it is one-on-one, -on -one, but there's other people around. I don't, I don't like that atmosphere of let's close the door, we don't want anybody to see you, because guess what, we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to do the same thing. Um, so yes, we do customized programs for eight to 80, I think I've had it 85. So yep, to answer your question. Who else? Mickey. Uh, Tim, first of all, thanks for being here and, and the philosophies, too. I think it's good and good ideas. I'm curious, we all, if I can go back to the Orioles real quick, we all hear about Cal and, and even about like Brady Anderson and he was a workout freak. I'm wondering if there's someone you can point to who really bought into what you're doing with the fitness, the training and everything that was maybe a mediocre or whatever, but it really helped them overachieve. Is there someone that you can point to that you work with that really, you know, they bought into what you were doing and they really had a nice or longer career because of that? Yeah, I think, again, I'm dating myself, but uh, when, when B.J. Serhoff came over from Milwaukee, Mike Bordick came over from Oakland A's, they saw what we were doing and kind of jumped on board. Mike Bordick's a great example. Um, and he's a fitness nut now. Liz, you probably have seen him around. Um, he worked out, but he, and I, I always I'll tell people there's a difference between working out and training, too, the athletes. Working out for me is going to your whatever, your exercise piece and sitting there reading the magazine and pedaling the recumbent bike, you know, watching TV. That's great. It's, you know, it, but at, at the performance level, at the athlete level, you've got to train. That's harder. It's goal-oriented. It's more intense and so forth. So some of these guys came over, saw what we were doing, and were like, hey, what's the, you know, I want to I wanna do that, and kind of bought in, and Mike Bordick took off. I mean, he came over here uh, as a defensive player to replace Cal when he moved over to third, and I don't know if that was that same year or the next, but he set an all-time Oriole record for RBIs in the month of April as a hitter, okay? And so he started getting uh, faster, stronger, and he took off. He became an all-star. Um, Mike Bucina worked out, uh, trained a lot. Uh, Scott Erickson, again, back in the day. Uh, there were some guys that couldn't get it. Uh, I don't need to mention their names. You probably remember some of them. Um, well, he had a nice arm, and he got away with it. He actually did OK. There was another young guy here at the time that had some trouble with the law that uh, had some issues. Another pitcher. Uh, another pitcher that just couldn't get it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, we, we had, again, that culture thing. I, I later, when I, was, when I was retired, I saw some other strength coaches at a convention or something, and a couple guys came up to me and said, you know, how did you always get so many guys in the weight room? I, I'm struggling all the time. I'm, like, pulling teeth. I'm, like, it was really kind of easy for me because I had Cal and BJ and Mike Bordick and all these guys coming in. And then we'd get a new guy, and they're, like, they'd peep their head in and, like, see all these guys in there. Well, I guess I better get in there. So that's that culture thing again. You know, it starts at the top, obviously. You know what's interesting, Tim? I remember, you, this made me think about it. You know, when I played baseball and I went down south for a year, the coach said, if I catch you in the weight room, you'll be off the team. We weren't allowed yeah. to lift weights. And that's how things have changed so dramatically, you know. I mean, baseball players back then, they never lifted weights. Yeah, it's a totally different. When I first started, we, there were still some old school coaches I would have to fight with. And luckily I had played professional baseball, so what I said had some validity to it compared to some other strength coaches that were coming from other sports like football. So uh, it was a lot easier for me uh, in that regard. Um, Bobby Bonilla in 1996 comes over in the stretch drive of uh, the playoffs. So we get this guy, uh, Mr. Angelos nixed a a trade to get him and say, no, we're, we're staying on this. He comes over. We had the rowing ergometers. It's a rowing machine. And we got, went through this phase of competing with the players. Uh, we had a, like a little Iron Man thing. If you could do 10 pull-ups, row uh, 500 meters under a minute 30, or run on the treadmill at 16 miles an hour for a minute. Wow. If you could do all three of those. And you didn't have to do them all at one time, but the problem is if you're big and strong and can row, it's hard for you to do 10 pull-ups because you've got big, heavy legs or you're tall. If you're fast on the treadmill, it's probably hard for you to pull that hard on the rower. So we had this little competition, and there was only three of us that could do all three of them. Um, 
Bobby Bonilla comes over and says, well, what's this? Oh, you know, but no, nah, I don't think you should do that. <laughs> or this is something we kind of did in the off season, but no, nah, I, I, I want to do that rowing machine. So they put him in the outfield to start, but then something happens and they make him a DH. The guy's never DH'd in his life. And he's sitting on the bench his first day of DH, and he's got his bench. He's like, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to be in the game. You know, and now there's an hour between each at bat. He doesn't know what to do. Bish, what should I do? I, I, I don't know what to do. Well, hit in the cage a little bit. No, I've already done that. Show me the rower. Bobby, not during the game. <laughs> oh, come on, it'll be fine. He, put, just show me how to do it. Puts his feet in there, gets on. Like, Bobby, do not do this. We're, it's in the middle of the game. <laughs> he, he starts going. He's like, I got this. And he starts going. He's trying to row 500 meters under a minute 30. Well, if you've ever run as hard as you possibly can, where you have to lay down and you can't breathe, that's the, where you get that hurting in your chest. He keeps going like, Bobby, you've got to stop, man. You're coming up next inning. <laughs> and so he does it. He, he finished the 500 meters. takes a minute 30. He just gets under it or right on it or whatever. And he can't get his feet out of the rower. He's so fatigued. He drops off the side, and his feet are stuck in the rower. And I'm like, getting him off. I'm like, Bobby. I'm like, close the door of the weight room. And he's laying there in a fetal position like this. I'm like, you've got to get up. Oh, bish. Oh, man. That killed me, it killed me. So now again, my job is flashing it through my eyes. I got my, the designated hitters laying on the floor in between, in between innings. Um, but we got him up, we got him moving, he finished the game, and I saw him years later at a, an event. He's like, first, bish, the rower, the rower. Every time I see him, he's a big, booming voice. Um, but anyway, that was an example of that, you know, the, the culture of he came over, you know, I got to fit in here. The Yankees done that so well over the years of getting the big stars to just buy in and fit in. So, the, you know, again, on the business side of it, creating that culture of this is how we do it. It's high quality. It's high end. We're going to work hard. I'm the leader. I'm going to be here early, too. I'm going to be here late. Jump on board. Um, when you get someone new and they, you know, they're going to feel you out. They're going to look around. Oh, this. OK, that's how we do it. Yeah, I mean, that's how they created the thing, the Oriole way. The that's right. Oriole way of that's doing right. things all the way down through the minor leagues. And you can do yeah. it the same thing in the business organization. This is how we do things. Yeah. Any other questions? Everybody, oh. Did you feel, did you take it personally that you felt cheated by the steroid error because you were doing it the right way and you got these guys out here? Uh, great, great question. I personally didn't. I think a lot of players did, the ones that didn't do it. Again, talking to the B.J. Hurst, Serhoffs, the Mike Borgs, Cal Ripkins, they, you know, they put up good numbers. They're competing against these guys. I was naive. I was a young person that I got a call, and I'm sorry if I'm talking too much, but I got a call from a reporter back in the 90s saying, uh, you know, steroids, there's a problem in baseball. I'm like, really? I, I don't see it. There were some guys that were whispered about, Jose Canseco's, the, you know, some guys that were whatever. I said, I don't think it's a problem. I said, but I think amphetamines are. And at the time, I thought that was a problem. Oh, OK. So I didn't hear much. And then a couple of years went by, and all of a sudden, I started, all the stuff started coming out. And then in hindsight, you look back, and you're like, yeah, you know what? There was more than I thought. Um, and then it all came out, and there was a lot more than everybody thought. But yes, the guys that, that didn't do it, which again, was a, most guys, uh, yeah, most guys did not. Um, but yes, of course, they felt that they were fighting an uphill battle. I mean, I had relief pitchers come to me and say, what do you think? I'm like, you're a relief pitcher. What, what, what's that going to do? Well, I heard so-and-so did it, and they recovered from their injury faster. I'm like, jeez, uh, I get why you're asking. I mean, this is your life. This is your career. It was tough. And looking back, I mean, I, I am so proud of, of the Orioles organization, the doctors, the athletic trainers, the management, the strength conditioning staff never even considered that stuff, ever, ever, ever. And it was around, obviously. But uh, well, I'm, I'm proud of the way they, we all handled it. Great question. Follow the rules. Name of the yeah. game. Anybody else? If you're interested in talking to Tim, he'll be available right after the talk. Does a tremendous, tremendous job. Great facility. Thank you so Thanks much, for sir, for being me. here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.